Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we'll be talking about proning intensive care patients and we'll specifically be targeting the respiratory mechanics and why it potentially could work and these are all theories that are fairly well established. So we'll go, go through what the respiratory mechanics of the chest wall are in the supine patient and in the prone patient then talk a little bit about what happens with normal lung and the ARDS or consolidated lung. Before you watch this video, I'd really highly recommend you watch the my videos on the basics of ventilation. You'll find that in the playlist. It's really important because you get a better understanding of what oxygenation is, how a CO2 removal works as well. So most of what this presentation is based on is a fantastic clinical review written by Gattanoni and um, colleagues. If anyone knows about Gattanoni, he's a fantastic and really well-published um, intensive care physician who's done some brilliant work on patients with severe respiratory failure. So I'd really highly recommend looking up his body of work. This particular paper was published in the Blue Journal in 2013, um, but actually there are other ones out there that are quite useful as well. But I think this is just a really nice, concise um, review. <clears throat> So what we're talking about is proning. And this is basically where you take the normal patient who's lying on their back, sitting upright in the in intensive care, and we flip them over onto their front. And you may have seen this in patients who, are, who have severe respiratory failure. And anyone who's managed these patients see sometimes you get these incredible improvements in both the oxygenation of the patient and potentially even the carbon dioxide removal of the patient. And so the question comes, why does something as simple as turning a patient onto their front cause these dramatic changes in both oxygenation and CO2 management? This picture was taken from a particular paper, just because it gives a nice picture of what a prone patient looks like. However, um, it's quite an interesting one also because it starts to talk a little bit about the complications of proning, which I won't go through in this particular um presentation. So the question comes as to how to prone the patient properly and again I'm not going to really touch upon that in this video. If you're interested there's a brilliant overall um, checklist and step-by-step -step method of how to prone a patient um, and this paper in particular I found quite useful in the past. Um, however there are others out there and Generally speaking, we tend to do the so-called swimmer's position where we have one arm up and the head turned towards the he the arm that's been put upwards. And then every so often we swap the arms around. Again, the logistics of proning, I'm not going to go through in this particular pe um, presentation. I'll just be talking about the physical mechanics of proning and why potentially it could work. So let's think a little bit about the normal ventilated patient. So this is a patient lying on their back, sitting semi-recumbently, a little bit upwards, and um, we are trying to expand the lungs up. Now, how do we expand the lungs up with positive pressure ventilation? Well, we have to push air into the lungs and create a pressure inside the intrathoracic volume to then push the thoracic cage up. And so this is what lifts the chest wall up, and it's the so-called transpleural pressure. This is the pressure difference between the lung itself and chest wall. And we use that to push the whole lung upwards. And you see with ventilated patients, the whole chest rises and then falls. Now, the other part of the movement of the lungs to help it to expand up, aside from moving it upwards and outwards, is it pushes down the diaphragm and we have to therefore consider the so-called transdiaphragmatic pressure. This is the pressure that's used to push the diaphragm flatter and therefore expand the lungs up. So with this in mind, you have to think about how we do it. And this is what we call the driving pressure. And the driving pressure is, you can consider as the transpleural pr pressure and then thinking about what it's fighting against. So with the chest wall, it's transpleural pressure minus the atmospheric pressure is what's going to allow the chest to rise up. In the diaphragm, 
is the transpleural pressure minus the pressure of the abdominal contents pushing up against the diaphragm. And it's that overall driving pressure that's going to cause the diaphragm to flatten out. So you can see automatically that if you've got a really big swollen abdomen, that the abdominal pressure is going to increase and therefore the amount of pressure that you're going to need to push that diaphragm down is going to be greater. And that's why sometimes in patients who are really difficult to ventilate, who have a lot of ascites or they've got dilated loops of bowel, we do sometimes open up the abdomen just to help us with the ventilation. And what we're trying to do there is to improve the transdiaphragmatic um, excursion. Again, really helpful to go back to my um, playlist of videos talking about the basics of ventilation to get a little bit better understanding of this. But with this in mind, let's think about the chest wall itself. So forgetting about the diaphragm, it, the movement of the chest wall is what's going to provide a lot of the expansion of the lungs and therefore movement of air into the lungs and out of the lungs. So in the supine position, if you imagine just watching a patient who's being ventilated, what you see is that the chest wall moves upwards and outwards. So there's the ventral chest movement. The diaphragm does move down a little bit and you do see a little bit of the tummy co coming up and that's because the diaphragm's pushing down, but certainly less than what you would see in patients who have normal spontaneous breathing where in patients with spontaneous breathing, the diaphragm does the majority of the work in expanding the intrathoracic volume. Now, if you think about the back of the chest, that's not really going to expand much at all. And that's because the patient's lying against it lying on the bed. So the majority of the chest wall movement is going to be the anterior posterior increase in uh, volume and a little bit of diaphragmatic flattening causing some increase that way as well. So let's imagine now that you flip this patient onto their chest. You've put a bar across their shoulders and you've put a bar across their pelvis so that tummy's hanging down and the chest wall is free. What happens now? Well, if you put the patient completely on the bed and not used anything to suspend the um, the chest up in the air, you're going to get no movement because it'll have to push against the bed. In children, when we put those bars, we do find that you do get some ventral chest movement. In adults, there's less, but it's um, certainly you do get a little bit. So it is worth suspending the chest if you can. And certainly in terms of the abdomen, it's really important not to be lying on that because you will just push those abdominal contents inwards and therefore push the diaphragm upwards. So the ventral chest movement is much reduced. The diaphragm will still move down and the dorsal chest wall is theoretically the thing that can then expand up. But because of the way the ribs are fixed to the spine, there is very little movement. So the thing that I want to emphasize here with proning a patient is that what you see is with the supine position, you'll get movement of the ventral chest upwards, which you can see here. You get a little bit of the abdomen moving because you get the diaphragm being pushed. Compare that now to the patient who's proned, where you can see here that you're push, there's having to push against the bed and so you're going to get much less ventral excursion by movement forward of the lungs. You're still going to get the diaphragm moving, but you're not going to get a huge amount of the um, posterior um, chest wall moving outwards, just because of the way it's all fixed with the spine. Now you can mimic a lot of what um, proning does by putting something heavy on the chest and what we classically used to do was to put the four litre filter bags on the chest. And we sometimes can mimic some of the physiology of um, pr proning a patient. Not all of it, as you'll see later. And that's what these two pictures here are trying to suggest. But I want you just to focus on this. So what I want you to know is that by proning a patient the chest wall becomes less compliant. 
it's less able to expand up. So you might think automatically, oh gosh, isn't that going to make things worse? Well, if that was the only physiological effect of proning, yes, absolutely, it would make things worse. However, what I'm going to show in the rest of this presentation is all the things that proning can potentially do to improve gas exchange, both in terms of oxygenation of blood and in terms of a CO2 removal. But always remember, you are potentially making the chest wall mechanics worse by proning a patient. So let's think first of all about the normal lung. This is a supine patient, and the way to think about the normal lung is sort of like a slinky. These are those big springs that you sort of move up and down. Now, if you imagine the lung, it does have some weight to it. So it's basically like a sponge. So at the top, there's less things pushing down on it. And so all the little gas bubbles, the alveoli, are going to be fairly expanded. However, as you come down to the bottom part of the lung, you've got all of this weight of the top part of the lung pushing down. And so you're going to start collapsing down those alveoli. So if you look at it schematically here, you can see that the alveoli at the back of the dorsum of the lung are that much smaller than the ones at the top. Now, theoretically, if you were to just turn the patient prone, so patient um, face um, down, what you're going to do is you're going to cause the weight to redistribute downwards. So most of the weight is going to be here. So theoretically, what's going to happen is that these alveoli are going to be pushed down more, and so you're going to be squashing them. And this is where the first bit comes in. Look at the shape of the lung. It's a triangle when you see it in cross section, or in three dimensionally, you could think of it as a cone. So if you're supine, can you see how all of the weight is pushing down on quite a large number of alveoli at the base of the cone, the pyramid, or the lung, whichever one you want to take as your analogy. Whereas if you turn them the opposite way around, can you see how many more alveoli are open? Because at the base, there's far more alveoli than there are at the apex. So although you might be squashing a few at the apex, the majority of the rest of the lung is now got a much less weight on it and therefore able to open up. So this is the first thinking about why proning might help with oxygenation. Now, you can take this theory one step further. So, as we said, imagine the cross-section of the lung as a cone. And this is all alveoli. So this is, without any um, gra gravitational effects, all we're going to have is lots of open alveoli. Now, that lung is going to sit within the chest wall. Now, the chest, you can imagine, is like a barrel. So you've already got a shape mismatch there. You've got this barrel-shaped chest wall, and you've got this conical lung. Now, the lung fills up the whole space of the chest wall. It has to. If it doesn't, you get the so-called pneumothorax, and you have to relieve the pressure, the air in there to re-expand the lung. So the lung will automatically be drawn up. So you can see how, if you're trying to fit a pyramid into a cone, the top bit, if everything's got to be touching, these bits of the lung are going to be drawn up into the chest wall itself. So you're going to get some additional expansion of the top of the lung, the conical part of the lung. Now, if you imagine someone with just gravity, these top alveoli at the top of the lung are going to be drawn up and there's no weight pushing down on them. So they're going to be really expanded. And then as you move down the lung, you're going to see these alveoli getting more and more pushed down by the weight of the lung above. Now let's think about the patient who's proned. Let's think first of all about the absence of gravity. So these two are just the absence. So if you think about just an isolated bit of lung, again, it's conical. And so you're going to have some alveoli at the bottom, more at the top. 
Now let's think about them in the chest wall itself. So the barrel shaped chest wall and the conical shaped lung. And remember that you've got the forces trying to pull this conical bit of lung against the chest wall because you don't want any air in between the chest wall and the lung itself because that will cause a pneumothorax. So you've constantly got this force pulling the lung open at the, at the top, the apex of the lung. And so if you imagine a patient with gravity now, yes, you're going to be putting a bit more weight on these alveoli at the bottom, but you've still got this force trying to pull the lung open to try and get it to conform to the shape of the chest wall itself. So now you can see automatically that these alveoli at the base, which you hear were completely collapsed, are starting to open up. And so you're getting all of these alveoli recruiting up. But in addition to this, the collapsing force from the weight of all of the lung above is being somewhat counteracted by the pulling of the lung against the chest wall because you're trying to fit a cone into a barrel. So this is the so-called shape matching theory that we're expanding up more alveoli by turning a patient onto their front. So you can automatically see that even though you're reducing the compliance of the chest wall itself, you're automatically improving the number of alveoli that are open, which will improve oxygenation. There's also the theory of just all the stuff in the chest is pushing down on the base of the lung. So you've got the great vessels, you've got the heart, all of these structures just pushing downwards. And for anyone who thinks that everything is fixed in the chest wall, this is a fantastic paper um, which shows basically what happens to the mediastinal structures when you change position. So this is a normal awake patient, and then they got them to lie on the lateral side with uh, under anaesthetic. And just look at how much the heart has moved over. All of the mediastinal tissues have just dropped downwards and caused here a bit of atelectasis. Now this is a really interesting paper because what they did is then they put them back in the supine position under a general anaesthetic, so positive pressure ventilation. And can you see here how this atelectic lung is still there? So that atelectasis hasn't improved. So this is how much the mediastinal tissues can move. And so you can imagine how over time you can just press down on the basis of the lungs, causing collapse. And by turning the patient forwards, i.e. prone, instead of the weight of the heart pushing down on the spine and the basis of the lungs, it's going to be pushing on the manubrium, the sternum, and therefore not causing as much compression of the lungs and relieving some of that pressure atelectasis. The other benefit is the so-called abdominal pressure being reduced. If you imagine someone lying on their back, all of the abdominal contents is going to be pushing down and therefore the diaphragm is going to be pushing upwards. If, however, you turn a patient onto their front and let their abdomen hang free by putting a bar or pillows across the shoulders and across the um, pelvis, all of the abdominal content is going to fall forwards. And as such, automatically the diaphragm is just going to be drawn down. The pressure inside the abdomen is going to reduce and therefore the transdiaphragmatic pressure is less. And so you need less driving pressure to expand or flatten down the bases and the diaphragm. So automatically you're going to get less need for that high driving pressure by getting rid of the abdominal contents pushing up on the diaphragms and therefore you're going to get more diaphragmatic excursion. Another important point to mention is the so-called gas matching. Now this is a bit of an interesting concept to think about. Just imagine you're getting the same amount of blood going through the top, the middle and the bottom bits of lung. If you imagine the blood going across the top of the lung, along like this, 
this blood is going to be oxygenated and CO2 is going to be removed. This blood is going to get less oxygenation and less CO2 removal because can you see how the alveoli are that much smaller? And this bit of blood is not going to get any oxygenation or CO2 removal because they're completely collapsed. They're not taking part in gas exchange, the so-called ventilation perfusion mismatch. So here, you've only really got two thirds of the blood being oxygenated and ventilated, and a third of it not getting anything at all. Now imagine you turn the patient onto their front, and imagine you've still got the same amount of blood going through all the different areas of the lung. Well now, you've got this bit of blood, this bit of blood, and this bit of blood, all getting oxygenated and having CO2 removal. And the reason is that, can you see how all of these alveoli are now open? Now you might ask the question, well, surely if you turn the patient onto their front, most of the blood is going to rush to the, uh, to the front of the patient, and when they're lying on their back, most of the blood is going to rush to the bottom of the lungs. Well, there's been a variety of different tests that have been done, both in animal models, spec CT of normal patients, that tends to suggest actually the blood flow throughout the lung doesn't really seem to change with proning the patient or having them in the supine position. So if that is the case, by just opening up more alveoli and not changing the blood flow at all, then you're going to just improve your ventilation perfusion matching. And for that reason, automatically you're going to improve your oxygenation and your CO2 removal. Again, go back and watch my videos on the basics of ventilation to understand that in a lot more detail. But there is this idea of improving your ventilation perfusion mismatch just purely by proning the patient. A really important concept is the so-called concept of compliance. And the best way to conceptualise this is by thinking about a balloon. Imagine trying to blow up the balloon from scratch, which is this one here. It takes you a lot of force, a lot of pressure, to get even a small change in volume. So this is the so-called atelectatic bits of lung, which is analogous to what you're seeing here. Now, as you keep blowing up that balloon, you start to get some air into it, which is here. And when you are at this point, it's so easy, just a little change in pressure will cause a big change in the volume. This is the rapid upswing part of the compliance curve. So really difficult when it's not got any air in it, and suddenly it becomes easier to blow up. This bit here. And then, as you keep blowing up the alveoli, or the balloon, it gets really difficult again to get any more change in the volume for the pressure, and then suddenly they burst. And this is exactly what's happening in the alveoli. So you can imagine how it's really difficult to actually blow up these alveoli that are all collapsed down. So you need a high driving pressure to even try to open up those alveoli. These ones might be sitting at this point here, so they're actually quite easy to distend. Whereas this one here, it's probably analogous to this, where actually it's already quite stretched up. Because again, with the shape matching, you've got the lung being drawn up to fill up the space of the chest wall, the barrel. And then consider this here, where you've proned the patient. Now, almost all of these alveoli are sitting in this range. So it's just taking a small amount of change in pressure to get a change in volume. So your driving pressure goes down. So remember before I talked about the fact that the chest wall compliance decreases by putting a patient in the prone position. But the benefit is that by putting a patient into the prone position, you're massively improving theoretically your alveolar stretch and strain. And so you're making it much easier for those alveoli to expand and to collapse down during the 
vent during the expiration phase, but not completely collapsing and becoming atelectatic. And as such, you can offset the reduction in chest wall compliance by actually significantly improving lung compliance. So you often find that the driving pressures come down quite significantly when you've proned a patient. And that's partly why that happens. Now that's all normal lung. And all of these things do hold true for ARDS lung, but there's more to it. ARDS lung, this is the consolidated lung that we're seeing here. Well, if you imagine a dry sponge, it's nice and soft. And then imagine that same sponge if you drop it into some water and then take it out. It's sodden, it's heavy. And the bottom of the um, sponge, if you put it onto a table, just collapses down with the weight of the lung above it. And that's exactly what happens in um, patients who are who have a lot of consolidation. So you can imagine that all of this consolidated lung is just pushing down on the basis and that's all collapsed down. Now, imagine turning that patient and can you see how the, the actual lung itself is so much more expanded? Just look at that compared to that. There's so much more air getting into all those areas. It's all being stretched open. You're not seeing that high density there. It's all opening up. So that's part of it. Because of that increased mass, you're going to get more atelectasis and therefore by um, turning the patient, you relieve a lot of that. And also, by changing the lung density distribution, you're going to get more aeration of the dorsal lung units, the bottom bits and you're going to improve chest compliance and therefore improve the amount of pressure, the driving pressure that you need to expand off the lungs. So all of the things that we talked about with normal lung are just that much more exaggerated in terms of the improvements when we think about ARDS lung, which is why it works so well for patients with ARDS. So in summary, what I hope I've shown you is that the chest wall mechanics do change. You might get some improvement in diaphragmatic excursion, but certainly you're going to get a reduction in the chest wall um, compliance. However, by a combination of shape matching, this is the theory of putting a conical lung in to try and fill up a barrel shaped chest wall. You're going to stretch open the apices of that conical uh, lung bit and so maintain the alveolar opening of those at the top. You're going to get better gas matching, i.e. VQ matching. If the blood flow stays the same in the lungs, then by having more alveoli open, you've just got more uh, space for the oxygenation and CO2 removal. And finally, you're going to be improving lung compliance. If you remember back to the collapsed balloon, the semi-inflated balloon and the over-inflated balloon, we're going to be in the sort of just semi-inflated balloon part of the alveoli for throughout the lung itself. And therefore, we're going to massively improve the amount of pressure that we need to get a big change in volume, i.e. to ventilate the patient. And for all of these things, it seems great for ARDS patients, and that's why we use it for patients with severe respiratory failure. I hope you found that useful. And if you have, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. I'll be producing quite a lot of videos on advanced ventilation as well as other aspects of intensive care management.